This is the Night Shift Podcast, powered by Black and Gold Banneret, your home for news and analysis from all UCF night sports. The Night Shift starts now. Welcome to Night Shift. Jeff Sharon here with you. I got Kyle Nash in the house. I got Bryce Turner in the house. And we are... We, by the way, boys, this week we have college football. Can you believe it? We are yeah. here. Week <laughs> zero is this week. This is week zero right now. What is it? Ireland for FSU and then and then there's... And Georgia S- Tech. Yeah, and SMU in Nevada, I think, is the other one or something. Whatever, man. It's been eight months. College football. Who are you trying to convince Jeff Sharon? I know. I'm just Get saying, excited. like, it's here. Get excited for Hawaii and Delaware State. I am more excited for Hawaii football than anyone can possibly imagine every year. I love those guys. Anyway, welcome to Night Shift. Uh, make sure you follow us at blackandgoldbanneret.com, uh, where you can find all of our uh, latest content. Follow us on social media as well. Boys, we got a lot to talk about today. We the Bryce, have. Bryce is calling for a bing. You don't do a bing in the introduction. Settle down. We'll I, know, I know. I know. I know. It's, listen. <laughs> listen. It's, it's, Settle it's, down. It's, now. It's, it's, patience, grasshopper. Patience. Well, hey, um, if you do want to go to blackandgoldbanneret.com, bing. Make sure you check out Bryce's previews at the quarterback and wide receiver. <laughs> those are good people. I guess. Um, we got uh, some football scrimmage stuff to talk about that Kyle was at. We are going to talk a little special teams. We're going to give you our media day interview with special teams coordinator Brian Blackman of UCF. We'll break that down a little bit. Got some news about the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame. We have one guy who we know is going to be inducted, and that was quite the reveal as well we'll talk about. And, uh, oh, yeah, UCF sports are actually already underway by the way, women's soccer got their victory to start the season. We will have a double header coming up um, this uh, Thursday for both soccer teams, which we'll talk about. But first, we'll talk about football. Kyle Nash, um, we are – well, UCF is not playing in week zero, thankfully. We're not playing in Ireland again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, listen, I, I, I'd like to go, maybe. That was 10 years ago now. You remember that? I do remember that. Oh, uh, UCF God. against Penn State in Ireland at Croke, the Croke Park Classic 10 years ago, the, the coming out party for Justin Holman, who had one of the greatest second halves I've ever seen. Um, the uh, But UCF will be playing uh, a, one week from this coming Thursday against New Hampshire. So it's scrimmage time this, we- this week. We only have one more weekend to go. So, Kyle, you... Uh, Caught up with some uh, media availability here and there, catching, keep, keeping an eye on things. What was the latest uh, that you've been hearing from uh, preparation for the season and this particular uh, uh, scrimmage that UCF happened? Well, this past Saturday, of course, talked to Coach Malzahn uh, and, and some other players, in particular uh, K.J. Jefferson, the transfer quarterback, and also uh, Kobe Hudson, now involved um, with with the team here in fall break after being injured during the summer. And, and listen, talking to Coach, he had reported after the first scrimmage that he was not happy with the mental errors he was trying to correct. He did tell us that um, he did see improvements. He's seeing those and mental errors go away like they were cut in half from one to two and then basically cut in half again from two to three. But the mission is still to eliminate all of that. And for those that are worried about the fact that their air quotes maybe not all gone yet, Keep in mind the the Gus Malzahn annual plan of two tune-up games to start the year with numerous transfers being in the building. That's the reason why I think you see that happening. You see more time to get those mental errors worked out. That's the news. What kind of mental errors are we talking about? So some uh, we're looking at situations like with the defense in particular, a lot of offside penalties there in that first scrimmage. A lot of guys probably with jitters, anxious to go. And, and you know, I, I know that it's different. You know, like, for example, the NFL uses joint practices in the middle of their camps just so you can hit another guy. Anything that's just changing scenery. Hey, look, we're going in the bounce house to practice. We're not on the practice field again. Anything that's a change in scenery is is uplifting and motivating. Coach, of course, also talked about the 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 um, intensity of practice. I even asked him. Uh, if if now that his hands are a lot more in it, is he enjoying himself more? In a way, he said, it's like, listen, man, when you're doing what you love, of course you like it more. It's not like he said to me, 
duh, but basically he said, duh, you know, but uh, he, he felt good about being able to inject more personally the improvement and see it happen. And that was really kind of the read uh, what, that there. What's the latest on uh, KJ? How's he settling? Because and the reason why, I mean, I know that obviously everyone's always right. My theory on on quarterbacks, and I think I've told you this before, mm-hmm. is I always like having a quarterback at least two years because it feels like the first year is it's you're still adjusting. You're still trying to figure things out. You know, there's a lot of stuff flying at you. You're not quite used to it. It's always the second year, you know, in a new place where everything works out. We saw that with Mackenzie Milton from 16 to 17. We Mm -hmm. saw that with Dylan Gabriel, although Dylan, I think, was a little bit even further ahead of the curve. He really improved by the end of his freshman year. Correct. Um, JRP. Was another good example. I think is the best example, frankly, as the least talented of the trio you mentioned, Jeff, uh, as a quarterback, simply for a lack of time in the barrel. What? Listen, JRP, when he was starting at UCF for the first time, was not cracking a Pittsburgh Steeler roster. Wasn't going to happen. Okay, now he's getting a picture with Tylen Grable in a preseason game. Now, granted, I know everybody's like, but Kyle, it's because he's a great athlete. Sure, but he couldn't throw the football at all. We aren't having this conversation, I don't think. He did enough to be noticed by scouts and get attention. And and to see what he did with John Rice Plumley, I, I even point Blake asked uh, Coach Hinshaw if that was part of what he was selling to KJ Jefferson. He's like, that and all the coaching I've done over years of part of what he's doing. And in connection to that, I asked KJ Jefferson what the biggest lesson he got from Hinshaw was. What was the aha moment? And in short, footwork and how how footwork makes him more comfortable, which takes me to this. I know you'd rather have him two years, Jeff. It's a great point. But when you got a fifth year guy, a guy who's played as much football as KJ Jefferson, and in his case particular, having a year where it was down and he's a little bit hungrier because he's like, he, let's listen let's read between the lines he's not going to say it because he's a humble kid but i'm pretty sure the consensus out there is the reason why he had a done down year was it because of kj jefferson but rather the scheme and the offensive line leaving him hanging out to dry there in arkansas okay seeing an opportunity where the o-line has been more stable at this point in the year than it has been in the past two i could certainly argue right seeing that happen and being in a place where darren hinshaw did what he did with JRP, and by the way, KJ Jefferson being more stu- sturdy is something that makes all the offensive coaches just a little bit happier at night. Uh, you know, th- having that fifth year, him being a fifth year senior, having played as much football as he has, Jeff takes care of that first year, so you don't have to reteach the position. You just have to fine tune, and that's where the footwork part comes in. All right, let's listen to and and we have KJ here, right? So let's go ahead and listen to that right now. Here's KJ Jefferson talking about what Kyle was just talking about with his footwork and adjusting as we get ready for the season. From a, a quarterback standpoint, I would say uh, just footwork, uh, just just being able to just really look at different NFL quarterbacks and just what it's a drop back or a quick game, the things the things that they do with their feet, and then I see, and then we go to the practice indoor and we work, and it's like oh. That speeds up the ball. It's, it's quicker now. Okay, I understand it now. So just just from him just being able to show me that and me not really just looking to it as much, I mean, as from a footwork standpoint, when I'm in the pocket and things like that, pocket presence. So for him to just pinpoint that out, like, hey, I think you can get better and transform your game at this standpoint right here. So this is what we're going to do today. This is the emphasis that we're going to focus on. So just having a guy like Coach Henshaw that pinpoints different things and then take it to the film, we look at it and go back and practice on it, and it makes a big difference. So just show that he knows what he's talking about, and I can trust in him. So hearing KJ Jefferson talk about footwork and how comfortable it can make him listen, the key to any quarterback in a situation where you're facing guys that might be able to break through a line if you have any lack of confidence in this offensive line, which you really shouldn't by now, um, it, when something goes wrong, being as comfortable as you can be is important. Seconds and steps matter, and finding that level of precision is something you want to see from KJ Jefferson coming in. All right, so... Not that many practices left to go until opening night against New Hampshire. We're feeling pretty good right now. I mean, listen, at this point in, in, in a world, it's not like they're coming out. I, I forget what the big LSU game is, but they're playing another major game again in week one. Um, it, it's not anything like that where you have something that could impact the college football playoff and your hopes later in the year. Certainly. Right. Um, but coming in with tune up games, I feel more confident. 
um, that this group will certainly kind of iron out any kinks. And I don't foresee any situation a la Boise State where you have just absolute nightmare, catastrophic, accidental twist of fate drops. And, of course, a major injury in the form of um, John Rice Plumley happening. So, yeah, I, I think UCF fans should be confident that you're uh, going to be ready for Big 12 play and maybe even snag a win or two uh, to open the conference play. I think you're talking about uh, LSU and their opener. They're playing, uh, is it USC? That's it. Yeah, I think That's, so. Yeah, right. yeah, I knew Las Vegas. Game. Yeah. So, yeah. So, all right. I want to move over to, um, you know, we've, we talked in our last couple shows. We talked about defense. We talked about the offense. We're going to give some love to the specialists now because, mm-hmm. first of all, those are my dudes. And second of all, those are people too, Jeff Sharon. <laughs> indeed, they are. But, um, you know, in, in close games, and we've seen this, and I sound like a broken record every year, but especially when you're in the Big 12. Mm-hmm. As we saw last year, the difference is performance in close games. And close games come down to special teams. Special teams will win you games. They will lose you games. They will win championships, and they will lose championships flat out. Mm-hmm. So a couple the key specialists in the kicking game coming back, they're both coming back. Colton Boomer is back Mitch as the place kicker. Mitch McCarthy is back. First, I want to talk about Colton, he's getting a little bit of a push from Grant Reddick, who I think we're going to see doing a little bit more kickoff duty this year as well. Right. Even though Colton's been doing pretty solid. Yeah, it came out. Matt Merchell reported this, Kyle, right? Mm-hmm. That in the, uh, I think it was the Oklahoma game. Remember the fake field goal? Mm-hmm. He suffered an injury. And from that game afterwards, he missed five of his last eight field goal attempts on the season. And really, if and and it really did affect him. I think it was on his plant leg. Yeah. And uh, and and that was and that was, you know, and, and it did if we were all wondering what is going on with Boomer, but well, that's what was going on with him. So yeah. based on what you've been able to find out, how's Colton looking for this season? Is he all healed up, ready to go? Yeah, no, I mean, he's he's definitely a, a back from injury. There's not really been injury concerns uh, uh, across the team. I mean, that that's the thing that Coach Malzahn arguably is most relieved about is not having a major headliner out for the year to no, open, no year, right? <laughs> no, please see R.J. Harvey and others that have happened throughout this time. I, people forget that about R.J. too, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. That, it, he, that, he, that he blew out a knee and and missed a whole year. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I'll put it this way. The, the smart money at this point would have been, if you got in your time machine, Isaiah Bowser may not have been a thing, or if he was, he would be a fullback well before he was a bruising yeah. runner. But And that's no disrespect to Zay. He still did a fine job, let's be clear. I, I posted plenty of uh, uh, gifts involving a certain video from a video game, uh, the form of Super Mario Brothers and that villainy. I'm just saying. But... Um, with all that being in mind, uh, in mind there with that, like uh, with when it comes to the special teams performance, um, Matt Marshall also asked about Riddick and carrying him and having a kickoff specialist and coach is very open. Yeah, we're looking into it. It's something we would definitely like uh, to support if we could keep, you know, Colton as healthy and as focused as possible on making kicks. So, you know, something that, that he's very open to there as well. Obviously, the official depth chart hasn't been released, but I wouldn't be shocked to see it. But yeah, Colton. Uh, and Mitch McCarthy, both, uh, you know, healthy, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'm looking for a huge imp- improvement in average uh, punt kick yardage from McCarthy. I, I think we've seen the stat many times. It's I, well, no. I was just going to say his net uh, UCF as a team net punting last year was 120th at 35.56. Now, this is with and I wanted to pull this up, too, because. Obviously, net punting is, you know, you're punting minus the returns, right? Right. Um, average punting, and I want to see if I can pull this up here. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, punt return defense was 107th, mm-hmm. 11th in the Big 12, 11.79. So that means they're giving up tw- basically 12 yards of return every single time. Right. Um, that's that's really what I think hurt that net punting because Mitch was actually pretty good last year. He was Mitch- – Mitch had trouble, I think, with uh, uh, getting the uh, getting too many um, touchbacks, mm-hmm. uh, which is a factor as well, and, and the length of your punt. There's no return, but 
you're losing 20 yards off the bat. And I was going to get there, but you're absolutely right. The team's coverage has not been uh, super great in, in, in that practice as well. And, and listen, Coach Black, uh, Blackman said as much talking to Bryson Turner that they're looking to improve big time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, by the way, return returner-wise also, um, Xavier Townsend is going to be back there uh, once again. We saw glimpses of what he could do. I think he had one call back, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, last year he had one punt return call back um, on a penalty. Um, but we know he's an experienced kick returner. We're waiting to see how many he can break out. And I think, you know, both both in the punt game and the kick return game as well. And I think we're going to get some other help on that side. But we don't know who yet because the depth chart hasn't come out yet. But we talked with Brian Blackman, uh, uh, UCF special teams coach, who's been here for a minute or two. And uh, and kind of got the lowdown from him on the special teams side of the ball. Let's go ahead and listen to our interview with Brian Blackman, UCF's special teams coach. Last year, you know, special teams ended up being a bit of a concern yeah. for the for the team. So, how do you? What's the biggest thing that you think that happened over the over the offseason with this group to kind of improve from that? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to own the fact that it wasn't very good. And we, I mean, quite honestly, I was embarrassed about how we played, and and statistically we weren't good. But it was bigger and deeper than just that. And so, uh, I think one, we got to have consistency in our specialists, which I think they have worked tremendously hard to be better. Uh, they've owned it just like our coaches have two we got to be better around them so our cover units we've got to get bigger and faster and I think part of that is recruiting and then part of that is just trying to build depth and and spend more quality time of getting our guys ready to play and that falls directly on my shoulders that's my responsibility so in the offseason we did a real deep dive into looking at the problems and uh you know, the, the things that stood out is, uh, you know, we were mismatched in terms of size in several games, and, we, and it showed up. Um, and we were having to play some some guys that were playing so many reps on both offense and defense that it, they, they wore down as the season wore down. And so for us, it's not only about getting our best guys on special teams, but also building depth on special teams, just like we try to in all phases. So we're, we're, we're – tremendously working harder and then we got to get a consistency out of our specialists and I think they've they've on that and uh and so we're we're in a position now where hopefully this year we're going to make the biggest strides of any phase of our of, of our team moving on to the tight end side of your coaching yeah how, how have you seen Randy Pittman grow to his new tight end one role this, uh, this yeah season? So I think what was good for Randy, what was healthy for Randy, was the fact that last year when he came in, we had a lot of veteran leadership and a lot of guys who were very experienced. And so his talent, we were able to use his talent, but we weren't, we weren't, we didn't have to require him to be an every down player. We had Alec Holler, we had Zach Wojan, we had some guys that were had played a lot of football, and we were able to put Randy in a position to to just do a few things and do them really well. He had, but Randy has a very high football IQ. He is a guy that learns, uh, like learns fast. But a lot of it is for him is it's important to him. Like when, when you talk about guys that absolutely love football and everything that football brings, he's that guy. And uh, I, I think he loves the game of football, and that's what makes it important to him. And so, uh, yeah, I think he's a guy that's going to have a big role for us this year. He's accepted that. Uh, I think at the end of the year, Randy Pittman will be one of our best football players. I was going to say, like regarding his speed and his hands, he almost plays like another receiver out there. How versatile is it to have a guy like that? Yeah, well, he has receiver skills. His ball skills are incredible. He has great hands. He has big hands, which helps him with that. Uh, but but he adjusts really well to the ball. But he also is a 235, 230, 235 pound player that's not afraid to block. Does a great job in the perimeter blocking game. And Randy, I mean, what stood out to Randy when he first got here last spring was we put him in the, in, in a drill against Trayvon Brash, and I mean he didn't back down at all. And so it, it wasn't like some some freshmen come in and they're trying to feel their way. Randy's not a toe dipper. He's not trying to see whether the water's hot or cold. He's just going hard as he can go every play. And and so I'm excited about where he goes moving forward. You, we talk about. Randy, you also brought in Evan Morris and Reese yeah. Atkins from the tran- from tra- transport. What do they bring into this tight end room? And is there any kind of like tight end competition, or do they does each of them kind of suit different things? Uh, well, I think each of them have things that they're better at. But I think what we what we're trying to do, we train them to do everything. 
Uh, but I, I think both of those guys, first and foremost, they were, they were brought in to add leadership to our room. We have a leadership vacuum last year. We lost two six-year guys and two fifth-year guys in our room when you talk about Alec Holler and Zach Wojan and Max Holler and Garrett French. Uh, those, those guys have been in here since I've been here. They got here and, and – uh, and so the leadership in that room was at a high level. You're talking about Alec, who was a guy that was a team captain, guys that had played – him and Zach had played a bunch of snaps. So those guys leaving, and you're talking about having a, a Randy Pittman and a Grant Stevens, like there was a vacuum there of guys that we needed some older veteran guys. And so we brought Evan in to bring – to kind of fill that role, but also to kind of fill the role in the 12 personnel that Zach did last year is to be the dirty work guy, put his hand in the dirt, be physical. The thing I love about him, though, he's way more athletic than we probably give him credit for. He can run. He's got good hands. He doesn't drop balls. And uh, and so I'm excited about what he adds to our room, uh, both from an off-the-field and an on-the-field standpoint. How about Reese? Yeah, you know, Reese is a guy that came in, uh, got here a little bit later – but has played football, has, has several reps played football at Eastern Kentucky. And, and I think he's a guy that as, as he continues to learn the offense, you will see he, what he can do and grow. Historically, UCF has had long snappers going into the NFL. Yeah. Gage King. What do you say about Gage King? Do you think he, he, he said he wants that to be his next goal to be in the NFL? Yeah, I, I think this, and I, and I have no hesitations about saying this. I think Gage King is one of the best long snappers in all of college football. And I've been around some good ones. Uh, obviously, when Alex Ward was here, I thought the same thing. Uh, you're talking about a guy that was a two-time finalist for the Manly Award and a starter in the NFL as a rookie. Uh, I think Gage King is every bit as talented. I think he works extremely hard. He and Alex are a lot alike in terms of the way they approach the game. Both of them is very important to them. Both of them take the long snapping position and they treat it like it's the most important position on the team. It's not like, uh, you know, one of those positions where, oh, well, I'm only going to play a few times a game. They're, they, they're wanting to master their craft. I love Gage King and what he brings to our, not only from a snapping standpoint, but a leadership standpoint in that room. And then he can cover. The guy can run. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about having him for sure. Thank you, Coach. You got it. So when you look at – you talked about the special teams and, and rebounding from that. When you look at Colton Boomer, how is he a different player than he was last well, year? Well, I think he's a more confident player. Uh, for Colton, it was never about talent. It was always about confidence. It was about handling the emotions of failure because uh, he didn't experience much failure as a freshman. And early last year, he didn't experience much failure. In fact, he experienced, you know, some game-winning success in the Boise game, but he was still young. And so uh, – for, for us, last year, even the question was, okay, how is he going to handle it when things don't go his way? Uh, he also had an injury that he had to overcome and deal with from an off season. I don't know if he bounced back the way he would want to. What I loved about Colton is that he owned that. He didn't make any excuses. He owned it, and uh, and then he went to work. And so what we saw out of him this spring and what we've seen so far at fall camp, I'm really pleased with him. Uh, what about – how about Mitch? <laughs> Mitch Mitch is one of the most talented guys. The thing about Mitch is he's – He's just now starting year three of football and even knowing what football is. You're talking about a guy that got here and was thrust into the start punter role, and, and he wasn't sure what the rules of the game were. And uh, so, but, but Mitch is older. He's mature. He's worked hard on his craft. I, I think you've got a chance to see his very best, uh, the best version of Mitch this year, and so we're excited about it. But we got to be better around him, and, and I think we will be. I remember Gus talking about close games and how important they are. Special teams plays a key role in in, in that. Yes. Like, how do you look at how the, 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 that's looking going into next season? Well, I mean, you you just try to prepare your kids for pressure situations and put them in that. And last year, early in the season, like I talked about in the boys' and game, we were able to do that. But as the season went on, we weren't. And to be honest with you, some of the games that we lost that were close games that we didn't get it done in special teams. And uh, so. You know, we're, we're constantly putting pressure on them. We're trying to build more depth, which is a big okay. thing, but I think we've addressed those needs both through the transfer portal and through high school recruiting, and we got guys that we feel like are ready to play in the Big 12. What do you think this team has the opportunity to do this season? I mean, our goal is to win the Big 12. We're going to control what we control. If we can win the Big 12, then everything else takes care of itself. I like the talent level of this team. I think our job as coaches is to inspire them, to get them to a position where they believe in each other and they believe that their best version of themselves is good enough. And, uh, and so we're going to do that. Every day we come to work, we're going to try to challenge them and push them to be the best version of themselves so that we can put a product out there that my nation can be proud of. Have you gotten a chance to play CFB 25? 
Now I don't own I don't even own a game console yeah, unless it's Atari 2600 or a Nintendo. I, I don't really know how to play. I think the last video game I played was Mario Kart with my kids, and they're all they're all grown now, so they're playing them. But I don't I don't I'm not a video game guy. Have you seen the, your your players playing it? Oh well, they love it. They talk about it. Like you go to meetings, they're they're definitely competing in it and, and uh, enjoying the game. I think it's great for college football. I think it's great for the players. I think it's for great for fans that love college football. I have no problem with it. But in the job that we do, we don't have time. And uh, and so I think that day is probably passing by. Maybe one day when I'm old enough to retire, I'll pick it up and see if I can figure out how to play. I'll probably play NCAA what forty or something like that, maybe. So, uh, what are you? The, what about as far as like just a team bond, bonding? Have you know? Have you noticed the team really coming together over this game? Well, yeah, I think so. I think you do that. I think you build your team chemistry in the off season. I'm a big believer that the best way to build team chemistry is to do hard things together. And I think it has to be that way. You have to do things that are really hard, difficult, that make you uncomfortable, but you have to do it beside your brother. And I think we've tried to do that. I think Coach Kinsey has come in as our strength coach, and he's put our kids in not only trying to build them as skilled players, but he's also tried to make them uncomfortable and build that part of the game too. And so, I mean, you think I, I feel that way, but I would say this about last year. The one thing to me that stood out about our team last year, we lost five games in a row. I've never experienced that. I venture probably none of our team or coaches have experienced losing five games in a row, but we didn't lose our team. And that would have been very easy for our guys to do. And I think that's what Coach has done a good job of, is building team chemistry, building guys that stick together. Uh, we face tremendous adversity, losing a quarterback, losing five straight games. But we still came back and we play Oklahoma down to the wire. We're, we're, we're still fighting to, at the end of the season to be bowl eligible. And, and so our kids never gave up. And so I think that's something that Coach does a great job of, and I think we'll continue to do that. Uh, Bryson, did you conduct that interview? I forgot. I haven't listened. He did. did. Okay. I'm going to bring it back and I'll bring you and Bryson to talk about it. All right. Three, two, one. Brian Blackman, special teams coach for UCF, who is going to play a huge role this year, I think. If UCF is going to turn around those close game losses that we saw last year and the close game wins, his unit is going to have to be part and parcel of that. Bryson Turner, who uh, helped conduct that interview, uh, as well, Bryson, what was your read between the lines for me a little bit here? What was the real, you know, the the real emphasis that that Brian was trying to get across? I think Coach Blackman was re- really owned up to the fact that the special teams were not perfect last year at all. I mean, we've talked about it from a statistical standpoint, but I think he, what, we're talking to him in media day, he himself acknowledged that, acknowledged that, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that good last year, and that it's more about owning up to that and moving on. I mean, we mentioned Colton Boomer; he, you know, he had that little injury, injury, injury issue, so that is certainly an explanation, but the, uh, an explanation, but you know that he would want to do better than that. So I think it's really just simple, simply the fact that you just have to move on and sometimes you just and you just have bad seasons sometimes and you they cannot have that ha- that kind of thing happen if UCF wants to win the win win these close games. Yeah. I wonder yeah. how how involved Gus is getting with that to take the mental errors out too with that Bryce and I think that's an interesting point. By the way, I make the argument Xavier T- Xavier Townsend is going to be the best kick return option UCF has had since the late Otis Anderson. That's, I mean, I have a hard time arguing with that. I mean, he's been, you know, he, I mean, RJ returned some kicks a little bit, mm-hmm. but it was, it was really X because he has just that flat out breakaway speed. Um, we've had, we had a little bit of bad luck too. I think that's the other thing with special teams. It's kind of like turnovers in a way, not quite the same, but okay. you know, you just have bad turnover luck. Sometimes you have bad special teams luck. Yeah. Now the coaches will say, well, you know, that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. We had, you know, a, a series of penalties also last year on special teams that messed everything up. Yeah. I get that. But, um, you know, is, uh, sometimes some some years it's your year, some years it's not, especially in the in the return game. Kyle, I want to get your last word on the on the special teams unit. Where do you think that you know, 
that this is going that this is going to shake out? Are we in for a surprise somewhere, or are we just going to kind of run with this and see what happens? I mean, I think special teams in this instance is a lot like O line play. The less you hear about it, the better. Uh, and if you do hear about it, something really good or something really bad happened, right? So I, I say all the above to say um, it, it's. I think it's going to be like leveled out on how much we talk about it. Oh, sure. We're all going to shout, okay, Boomer, when Colton hits the field goal. I get that. but uh, no, We're not going to shout, okay, Boomer. We don't shout that. Why not? No, because we shout Boomer. That's why. You do you, Jeff Sharon. I say, okay, Boomer. Have you not seen? You're the only the, guy in the building doing that. The black and gold banner. Trust me. Ding. Hey, I, I, Bryson Turner's going to back <laughs> me on this. Notorious Bryson Turner's in the building. I'm not, hey, I'm not doubting the veracity of that. I'm saying you're the only guy in the building doing that. Hey, <laughs> who's to say a guy can't have more than one call phrase? Well, uh, I'm going to let that one sit right hey, there. I'm um, the student of the game. I'm the architect of the bing. I have several names too, Jeff Sharon. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> our uh, our erstwhile friend Andrew Glukov had some had, had multiple nicknames too, but uh, we, yes, we, we digress. Right. Um, all right. Uh, so let's see. Tw- was it the 20 nights? So we're 10 days away. That's right. A week, a week after the women's soccer doubleheader. How's that for a segue, boss? Well, we'll get there in just a second. We got uh, a couple other things to talk about when we get back uh, from the break, including some UCF Hall of Fame news. And we will update you on, by the way, the athletic season is underway. And we'll talk about women's soccer kicking off the 2024-25 UCF athletic season when we return. This is Night Shift. For all the latest news and analysis from every UCF sport, visit blackandgoldbanneret.com, your home for the UCF Knights on SB Nation. We bring you all the latest news and in-depth analysis from across Knight Nation, from football and hoops to golf and tennis. If you want to stay on top of all things UCF, visit blackandgoldbanneret.com, powered by SB Nation. We're back here on Night Shift. Jeff Sharon, Kyle Nash, Bryce Turner. Um, some Hall of Fame news that we're going to kick off with here uh, since we come back from uh, football here. Uh, it was a little bit of a surprise at the uh, kickoff luncheon. Shaquem Griffin was the uh, keynote speaker. And uh, while he was there, uh, Terry Mahajer and President Alexander Cartwright of UCF joined him on stage and surprised everyone in the building, including Shaquem, with <laughs> news that he's he will be inducted into UCF Athletics' Hall of Fame uh, this year. Um, we will be will there will be uh, a, an induction in the fall. Uh, there will be a uh, recognition of the inductees. Uh, during the um, Arizona, uh, d- dur- during I believe the uh, is it is it the Arizona game? I'll have to double check. I don't know if that's been officially announced, but um, it, it will be during a football game for sure. We also don't know who the other inductees are. Uh, he was the first one to get word of it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you remember, Mark Daniels was notified during d- notified last season of his induction during the during the pregame. I was yeah. right there. Yeah, I was right there in, in and, the. In, I was right there next to him on the other side of the glass. Yeah, and that was before like the press release went out. Right. So I would say we're, we're still. I would say maybe a couple, maybe two weeks out, maybe three potentially from hearing the full the full class. But we yeah. got a preview of one of them with Shaquem. Yeah, with Shaquem, and and and. And I get that because you know UCF kind of wants to do, I guess, maybe not. I, I think they kind of want to do something similar to what the NFL does, where the guys show up at their at their door, you know, but but uh, not showing up at their door. But I'm saying like something to kind of like you know make it so that you know they're not not everyone's just finding out via a, a Zoom call. Yeah, coming or, out coming out in studio like they did with Bill Cower and Jimmy Johnson is, is yeah I'm yeah they want to do so, they want to do something something to make it special, and I like that. I like the fact that they that they want to do that, but we don't know who's, who's up. Yeah. Bryson, go ahead. Well, I think it was also a matter of convenience because remember Shaquem Griffin was already listed as the keynote speaker for the kickoff lunch and for quite some time now. True. And so it's quite, and, and, and so I think that this was, it, this is more of a, a happy coincidence that it all happened, that, that it all, that <laughs> it is all, and I say coincidence as in, in giant air quotes, <laughs> mind you. Yeah. Um, but 
you while know, you're here. But let's, <laughs> of course, Shaquem Griffin, this was his first year of eligibility because for players to be eligible that got their bachelor's degrees, you you your t- first year of eligibility for the UCF Athletics Hall of Fame is seven years. So Shaquem Griffin is actually, you could say he is a first ballot Hall of Famer joining the likes of Shelby Turnier, who did who, a softball pitcher who did that last year in 2023. Mackenzie Otis, another softball pitcher, did it in 2022. And then Afia Charles, an Olympian, was inducted in her first year of eligibility in 2021. Yeah. So there it, is some talk, Bryson, that technically speaking, he's even a little early because his 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 um, uh, uh, eligibility technically ended in late 2018 because that's when the bowl game was played and all that. But hey, I think they're wedding. Really, we're going to parse that. Kyle. I'm just, <laughs> I, no, I, hey, listen, I think it's newsworthy because he's getting in and nobody seems to care. And that's I'm a just, good thing, Jeff Sharon. 2017 was his last season. And that's kind of the, the seven years. The date of the final games. Yeah, listen, I, let me have this one, Bryson. I got the magical stat. Okay. I'm getting Normally, bored already if, thinking if, of this. If there was anybody like because wow. let's put, let's put it this way when you look at the 2017 team the two big faces you stand out on that are Shaquem Griffin and Mackenzie Milton Mackenzie Milton is a little busy at the moment and also he and also he his year he's he, he's not eligible yet because of course he played during the 2018 season mm-hmm. so Shaquem Griffin getting inducted first I think makes yeah complete and total sense because if you miss a chance to induct him in any years at all what is the committee even thinking it, what are we doing well let's <laughs> an obvious choice let's 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 be fair he was always going to get in oh yeah there's no doubt about it and and i encourage everyone to take a look at eric lopez's column on black and gold banneret.com where he discusses you know how he shakeem griffin is the greatest ambassador of UCF yeah. football, probably UCF athletics that you're ever going to see. Um, I'm like mint the statue and put it up on Iowa Plaza right away. You were not unique in that, actually. I know, <laughs> and I know exactly, and I know exactly what the statue is going to look like. You know, it's going to be that sack against Auburn. I was there. I was in the building. Um, that was one of the great performances. And and to tell you the truth, that you know. He was the defensive player of the year in 2016 in the conference. 2017, the secret was out, and guys keyed on him. But you know something? He, you know, he didn't really have that many, you know, takeover performances in 17 in his senior year. But, man, in that game against Auburn, Gus knows. Well, he was asked about it, Jeff, in, yeah. in, in that same scrimmage, uh, scrimmage uh, uh, availability that we talked about. And the, the person asked the question, you never coached him, but, but he's like, but I coached against him and he was coached against him. That he's, dude was a problem <laughs> or problem. He said one of the two. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and just, you know, I, I'll never forget my favorite time. Cause this was, this was when I started covering UCF in 2017, he actually snagged an interception against SMU. And the question I asked him was, I guess he forgot you used to play DB. He had a real great laugh on that one. When I was talking yeah. to him about it. Well, one of my favorite things, I think, uh, and we talked about this, we had a, um, I think during COVID, we had a great podcast with Trey Neal. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the Peach Bowl. And this was the kind of player that Shaquem was. Um, you know, obviously he had the 12 tackles, three and a half tackles for loss, had at least one sack. But the most important play he made was one that didn't show up in the stat sheet. And it was on the final play where he realized that um, – Auburn center was hurt, came out of the game. True freshman center comes in. Mm. And he decided on that key play with Auburn driving, and they had our defense against the ropes up seven. Um, And he decides he's going to rush that center. And you go back and look at the film of that last play. Um, It was Shaquem who made the – key pressure on Jarrett Stidham that forced him to get rid of the ball sooner than he wanted to. The receiver did not come out of his break in time and that allowed Antoine Collier to step underneath and make the interception in the end zone that ended the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was that play. I mean, we'll talk about, you know, people think, oh, Stidham just threw it up there. The reason why I threw it up there was because of Shaquem Griffin. 
yeah. who made a heads up play, interfered with his throw, and that's what got UCF out of that game. Yeah, it was a, it was, a, it was a real, it, it was that was the best play he made that day of his best game. Yeah, that sent Auburn spiraling, and then Sidden came out again and threw an interception to Shaquan Burkett that, for that pick six that sealed that. Beat. Yeah, everyone remembers that one, but but you know, remember we were <laughs> Auburn. Auburn went into hurry up mode right after that because right, yeah, that game was uh, not over. You set up the context for sure. Yeah, yeah, I was just I was just taking it home. You're absolutely right yeah. in all of that, and 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 uh, you know the stories of him sleeping in the building and, and just all of the buzz surrounding him. And yet he would, there was twice he stayed late to talk to me in one and ones yes. my first year credentialed with UCF. He, he didn't know me yet. So, you know, amazing stuff. Uh, yeah. That's all I could say. I think what makes like th- this uh, such a cool moment for just UCF ambassadors in general, because really think about the best players in UCF football, uh, football history, Asante Samuel, Dante Culpepper, Brandon Marshall, all those they went on to play for a long time in the NFL and I would think, and more than likely a lot of people would remember them for their NFL careers, or at least a majority of them. Dante, a little bit different, but Shaquille- I don't know if Bortles is really remembered in the correct way. I mean, but I digress. But the point being is that, is that their UCF career is what they're majorly known for. And so to see, and so to see that that, that have UCF have an ambassador like that for uh, for them to be up to, uh, go up to bat for UCF on on the regular basis because I can see Shaquem Griffin doing this for a long time. And it just it's it's just feels right. Yeah. So congratulations to Shaquem, and um, you know we're happy for him. Obviously, well deserved. Um, yeah. Just I don't know. It, it's it's. It also seems kind of weird, like we're inducting the Griffin, one of the Griffin brothers into the Athletics Hall of Fame. We're already getting so old. All right. Um, not, none of the old stuff. Oh, no more old guy talk. Let's talk new. And that is the new season. All right. Women's soccer already kicked off the season. And um, they did so in style down in Boca Raton against FAU. This was a game, uh, Bryson Turner, that was played in FAU's football stadium. To kick off, not at their soccer complex, at FAU's football stadium in front of a thousand fans. And, uh, well, all the folks down in Boca got treated to an absolute boat racing by UCF of FAU. Uh, two goals in the first half, three more in the second half. UCF wins five to one. Uh, our uh, One of our preseason interviewees, uh, Chloe Netzel, scored two goals within nine minutes of each other. Uh, in the uh, in, in the game, one uh, toward the end of the first half, one in the at, right off the bat in the to start the second. Also, Eddie Atim, who we also spoke to, she she actually opened the scoring two minutes and forty nine seconds into the season. Uh, first match, yep. First of that, so Chloe uh, ends up with uh, three points, uh, a goal, and. Uh, yeah, a goal, or excuse me, two goals and one assist because she, she assisted on the goal to Eddie. Um, and UCF took a grand total of 12 shots, five, five of them went in the net. Um, the Can't ask for a better start to the season, um, Bryson. I don't know really what other analysis we can come up with that other than, uh, yeah, exactly what you want to happen happened. Well, here's a little comparison for you because UCF played FAU early last season in in 2023 in Orlando and they won that game 2 to 1. They go to Boca this time and win 5 to 1. I feel like any offensive worries I had that that I had last season about this team had definitely ha- looked to seemingly have been addressed in some capacity here because Eddie Eddie looked good. I mean she that def- the fact that she went and got that goal immediately it reminded me of Saku Heiskanen a little bit, actually, when he had that breakout performance in that season opener against Clemson. And so, also, don't count out Jessica McCullen. She also ended up getting a goal in that one as well. Han- Hanoka Hamano, transferred from Clemson, got a pair of assists as, as well, as well as a goal in the, the last goal, the last goal, the fifth one. And when you look at the shots, mind you, FAU actually got five shots on goal of 10 shots total. So 
How about putting a bit of a hand out there for the back line and true freshman goalkeeper Sammy Lipkin? Mm-hmm. Cause she had a couple of uh, some solid, I would say a couple of a few solid saves in that one as well for her first, first match competitive match as a true freshman. So I, considering the new faces that are, that are, that are on this team, this, uh, this I think is an outing that you really could, that could not have really gone any better for UCF. Now, of course this is an FAU team that, say. that finished 218th in RPI last year. Let yeah. make no mistake. They're picked fifth in the American this year. I, I I was gonna I was gonna channel my inner Eric Lopez and like, but Bryce is there for you. I mean, what what are we getting excited about? Well, what, what do they have next on the schedule? Maybe we got something well, we actually get excited about here. Well, they played FAU last year and they beat them better. Bad, they beat them. Be- they beat them better this year than they did last year. Is my point. I, I would I would I would I would in, I would uh, reach back to um, you know uh, the, the the press releases for UCF. Uh, Football, you know, a win is certainly better than a loss, and to, do, to win five to one on the road. Shouts to uh, Dan Forsell. Huh? Yeah, shout out to Dan Forsell uh, and Andy. But um, I think Coach Tiff would probably look at us and be like, "Listen, don't get too excited either here." Now um, they have their next game uh, as part of a home double header coming up this Thursday, the twenty second. Uh, it starts with the women facing Utah Valley at 5.30 p.m. Uh, on ESPN+. Plus. And then following that, the men, who are currently ranked number 19 in the preseason United Soccer Coaches poll, will face Mercer. Uh, we will have our preview of the UCF men's soccer team uh, on Black and Gold Banneret, as well as the podcast that Bryson and Eric conducted uh, previewing the team on black and gold banneret as well. Hi, Mike. So, um, it, so, it, it, but first of all, I I like the double dip thing on Thursday the twenty second. Women followed by the men. Um, Bryce, it's the first event on campus this season, huh? First it's the first event on campus this season. That's right. First campus event is uh, is the uh, is the double header for. Uh, for soccer, but uh, anything we to know. Jason Turner on the podcast. Jeff. Yeah, I know. Well, what do we need to know basically heading into that uh, for, for really both of those teams, for both Utah Valley and uh, for, on the women's side and Mercer on the men's side? Well, to start with the women, this is a this is a revenge, a bit of a revenge game for them in some ways because both, remember back in 2022 they traveled out to Utah Valley and ended up being a scoreless draw in a game that Coach Tiff admitted was not their best game. So players that were on that squad that went out to Utah, they are definitely looking to redeem themselves after this last one. Also, Utah Valley is projected to win the WAC, by the way, so they're not necessarily a slap a slouch a slouch either so even though their rpi finish last year was listed as two as 282 so i would say that this is another one of those litmus tests type thing mm. like kyle like kyle said you know if you don't want to be go be too hard on fau and i think the same logic can kind of apply here i almost like to think they're almost like football, really, where their first two games are seemingly kind of t- more tune-ups. At least when you look at their pre their last season reputation, they've acted like well, a Utah couple- Valley that. <laughs> I know. I, oh, for sure. Don't do that. But <laughs> essentially, like a pair of tune-up games because they oh, have. They're not a, listening <laughs> because they have it because they do. I I only do this because of the numbers I'm seeing, Jeff. The, so they have Florida away in Gainesville coming up as their third match, and that's going to be a test. And so I think that between this FAU match and then this Utah Valley match, we're going to get an idea of what kind of UCF UCF we're going to get for that all important matchup against Florida. Now the men's team, they're playing the defending Southern Conference champions in Mercer. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when we played Mercer in the same conference in the Atlantic Sun, but that's neither here nor there. They uh, were picked first in the SoCon preseason poll. Four players on the preseason uh, all-conference team in the SoCon. Um, They uh, won the SoCon last year. Uh, And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is – don't laugh. This is a pretty good team that uh, that UCF that the men's team is facing uh, to start out. And we have our preview up on, like I said, black and gold banneret, uh, dot com. But 
Bryson, when we look at Mercer in particular, what are we anticipating here? This should be this should be a, a good test early. Oh, absolutely. I mean, rem- I remember every single con- non-conference opponent that UCF men's soccer is facing, bar one, made the NCAA tournament last year. Yeah. So this is a murderer's row of opponents that that Scott Calabrese has lined up for them. You have the favorite to win the SoCon, Mercer, the favorite to win the WAC, Seattle, the favorite to win the Big West, UC Irvine, and oh yeah, two team, and then you have Wake Forest, who's ranked number 15th in the nation, and oh yeah, you also have FIU at ranked second in the, projected the ranked second in the American, and USF, who's projected to be fourth in the American, even though USF is the one team that did, of our non-conference slate, that didn't make the NCAA tournament last year. They're no slouch either. Coach Calabrese is hungry this year. He's, I, I think, I've been getting that vibe from him this entire preseason, and I would argue that Mercer is 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 the is the only per team that finished higher than 100 in the RPI until October 18th on the schedule. And, and by the way, they're, they're, you mean the only, only team ranked in the triple digits, right? Yeah, and they're, yes, oh yes, in the triple digits. The right. next time, UCF, and they were and they were still their conference champion. <laughs> oh yes, exactly. UCF is not going to see, at least from a 2023 RPI standpoint, they're not going to see another triple digit team until they play Old Dominion on October 18th. So, in a way, you I would call this a two a quote unquote tune up game the same way like Georgia would call a, 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 a would call a tune up game against Clemson to open the season or something like that. This ain't no tune up game. <laughs> this is, exactly because it isn't. It, 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 because it isn't. So this is a they want you Scott Calabrese wants to give you this this team the biggest test that he can give it right out of the gate. And I think in terms of that type of thing, I think Mercer is an absolute perfect, I would say in a way benchmark for 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 this seat for this season because UCF I think is expecting a lot out of this team. I mean they're ranked number 19 in the nation. They're bringing back a lot of key players of uh, uh, players from a team that reached number 1. They want to make sure they come out of the gate swinging just like they did last year on the road against Clemson. And both teams are going to be in action again on Sunday. Uh the men's soccer team home against number 23 Seattle. Uh, so that's a top 25 matchup right out of the gate at home. Five o'clock, the start for that one. Women are going to be at Florida in Gainesville. 6 p.m. start on Sunday for that one as well. That game is going to be on SEC uh, Network Plus. All the UCF home games will be on ESPN Plus, both Thursday night games and the Sunday uh, uh, evening uh, men's soccer game against uh, Seattle. We also have uh, volleyball's got their black and gold scrimmage on Saturday. Um, but after Sunday, after that game wraps up up in Gainesville with women, our next game, our next UCF sporting event will be opening night against New Hampshire in the bounce house for UCF football, 7 p.m. Thursday, August 29th. Off we go, gentlemen. I guess I better get my laundry done so I got the tie ready. Here we go. Oh, God, the tie. Oh, God. I'm going to get you a new tie. I've had it. I've been begging for a black and gold banner at time for years, Jeff Sharon. Thank you. Um, huge <laughs> thanks to those of you who've uh, who are listening and subscribing. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast uh, on Apple and Spotify as well. Make sure you look at uh, our social media as well. We are on Facebook, X, Threads, Instagram for all the latest news regarding all UCF teams. Visit us at blackandgoldbanneret.com, your home for UCF sports news and more. Uh, we will be back. Oh, by the way, don't forget, like as we said, our women's soccer preview is up. Our men's soccer preview is up. Volleyball is going to be coming up this week. Uh, we're going to be finishing our position previews as well with the quarterback and special teams as well. Bees. Lots more content coming for you over the next 10 days as we prepare for UCF football's opener. And then we are off and running this. Uh, it is showtime. So for all of us at Black and Gold Matter and on the, and here on Night Shift as well, for Bryce Turner and Kyle Nash, my name is Jeff Sharon. Thank you so much for listening. This has been Night Shift. Go Knights. Charge on. See you next week.